that's the benefit of being live in the session. Um, no, no response, even not there. Okay. Um, central something, something. Yeah, no, not quite. I wanted to go for scalability um, because that's one of the points that we make when we talk about cloud services. Why do we host something in the cloud? Guess what? First of all, we don't have to deal with this. Uh, Same good answer. Well, we could, should in principle be able to scale arbitrarily. Good answer, right? So that's uh, the actual, you know, having this idea of uh, not needing to hold resources, particularly hardware resources, locally, physically here, you know, set up and being ready for Christmas time, right? Hopefully this thing is fast enough, right? Um, but actually saying, yeah, whatever. I mean, I just, you know, let it scale up automatically and down and only pay for that time in the time frame, right? So uh, scalability. And by isolating, you basically have the, and now for that reason, by isolating the different services, you have this benefit, right? So uh, you may just need to be faster in payment processing, but you still don't necessarily need to have multiple instances of your database. Probably you should keep one only, or think, if, yeah, think, think about different arrangement of architectures in the first place there. Um, but um, that's that's the main point uh, there, right? So and if you have, for example, extended need for caching of your website and providing it, probably you replicate this front end facing bit. But perhaps not the business logic if not needed and so on. So you can isolate the different parts of the um, application more more effectively by having this concept of containerization, let alone making it more maintainable, right? So if you have an update on one component, you don't necessarily need to tear down all five, but you know, just, just spin up and down this one container and hopefully it will automatically reconnect. So that automatically reconnect this is something we need to talk about as well. That's going going beyond this particular session, but that's the aspects I just wanted to motivate here, right? So, okay, so we have different forms of virtualization, type one, bare metal virtualization, pretty much hypervisor, VMs, type two, operating system, hypervisor, virtual box, you name it, and then virtual machines on top of it, still a bit heavy, a lot of operating systems in there, right, so replication of everything, in fact, usually the block of whatever is actually in virtual machines, just operating systems, so 10 or 20 gig of operating system, plus one, I don't know, let's say 15 megabytes of software um, compiled, so that's very convenient, isn't it? And uh, then we have containerization, where we get rid of OS, but then say, oh, you know, we just want the libraries that we need for this particular service, however, at the risk of duplicating those. So if we had, you know, want to scale up that service, bad luck, we have five containers of the same kind, bad luck, we also have five times the same libraries, right? So, but that's something we can, we can operate on. That's a compromise, that's okay. That's actually not the biggest one, the storage one, but it's an implicit one, uh, because, you know, the more, um, um, the more storage you consume for VM, by definition, the longer it takes to simply boot it up. So it's not much the price of storage, but the efficiency that is sacrificed by needing to perform more reads, right? Because, you know, the memory uh, permit anyway, right? So the more you offload to hard disk, let alone network, the slower things get, right? Because the closer to CPU, the faster. So um, that's also a kind of a natural consequence, but not so much a, a economic, uh, technically not really an economic constraint at this current stage, at least for the kind of operating systems we're dealing with now. Okay, um, right. Good. So, uh, yeah, today I just want to walk you a bit more through Docker. I did this very um, um, superficially in the last session just to get you a glimpse of what, what we're talking about. But um, just, um, yeah, to motivate this few terms that you want to know about um, or be aware of, I talked briefly about the difference between a concept of images and containers, right? So. I compared this to the idea of class and object and object orientation. The idea is that images, you know, are basically compiled blueprints of a running service, if you liked, or of a container, if you like, that are just sitting there and you can instantiate them. Very similar, if you recall OpenStack, in OpenStack, you need to um, choose a operating system, you know, a, stock, a ROM you basically want to boot from uh, in the first place. Uh, and that was very similar because it's basically an, an image of an operating system. And then you run your containers or VMs in the open, um, open stack world and basically install whatever you want on there, right? Similar here, you have a stock image of your service that is, and then you instantiate multiple containers. And that's the idea that it makes it so flexible. You can just say, yeah, spin me up five of those. I don't care, right? So and then things will happen more fully. So then there's the concept of um, Docker daemon. So again, now it's very specific to Docker, of course, because that's, to be honest, it's the mark, it's the market leader in this in this area um, uh, for oh I'm not a nice person no one told me so sad. all right I'll share my screen I didn't share my screen let me repeat this nine, nine, nine. so all right 
Good. All right. So I just talked about image containers, right? This this is uh, one to n uh, relationship, if you like, one image and containers from it. That, uh, classical, quite straightforward. When this is quite generic, you find it across a wide range of different virtualization architecture. But more specific to Docker, just to motivate it, because those terms will be used, is the Docker daemon. Daemon is uh, Unix word for service, uh, historically, and Linux is borrowed, is of course. So every time you read daemon, uh, not daemon, by the way. Um, then you think about a service running in the background. So that's something you interact with via, a, you know, a command line interface or GUI or whatever else. Very important concept. And then it's Docker client, right? That can be something that you use to interact with. That's something I will be using actually to do something in the first place. But what it fundamentally does, it always interacts with the daemon in the backend. And this daemon is responsible for, you know, the creating the containers. I mean, building them first state, uh, running them, restarting them, you know, dealing with error handling and all that kind of jazz. Or distributing them even further so it's quite that's where the magic actually happens that's also the one that ensures that all the uh, containers are restarted when you for example reboot your operating system right would be natural so otherwise you would think oh you now i need to run all those commands again no 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 that's the nice part is actually uh, uh you know a a, a fixed uh, entity that keeps track of the state and also reboots your containers that said your containers need to be robust enough to sustain that as well right so you need to have a proper shutdown and uh, uh, um, 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 bootstrapping mechanisms to, to start those up again. And then there's another concept, which is like, uh, yeah, it's borderline on the commercials, not so much 100% technological side, but more on the kind of um, yeah, commercial side. It's like um, a Docker Hub. And Docker Hub is basically like a public um, container registry where those images, those container images, are basically hosted publicly and can be downloaded, pulled, as it says, um, and then instantiated on your client. So uh, think about it like GitHub for Docker containers, right? So equivalent. I think, in fact, that is literally the metaphor they're they kind of uh, used when they uh, device this. And Docker, all oh, those container registries are by no means constrained to that one. This is more like the default registry that Docker images are drawn from when you request them and is publicly available, of course. But you can also host this privately. And many companies, in fact, do because they have their own images they don't want to share with the whole planet, right? But nevertheless, they want to have a shared repository within uh, a company, for example, corporate uh, environment that is kind of pre-configured to different instances. Um, and uh, most IS providers provide this out of the box. I mean, um, if you recall um, Google Cloud Computing, they have this, the container registry as well. So that could be, if you wanted to, only visible to your project or within your organization, if you liked, but hosted on a, on, on, in an IIS environment. So it's by no means uh, uncommon to have this. But those are the few concepts I just want to be clear about before talking about it. So uh, I mentioned already, um, there are certain steps for installing Docker. Uh, again, they're, they're in the slides, but they're also in the, um, uh, in the Docker shorthands um, page on the wiki, which I modified slightly. Um, and uh, they have the essence of, you know, how to get, get your Docker setup going. So I encourage everyone who haven't, hasn't yet done already um, just spin a VM again, up a VM again, um, or use an existing one that is, and just install and run Docker in there just to get a feel. Okay, so um, right, so now let's talk a bit about um, Docker. Or oh, in, in in fact, um, I mentioned a few uh, things last time already. I I think I did. In fact, you know how to get um, play with existing images, right? So Docker has a set of um, commands built in so when you run docker you don't necessarily just um, you know um, so or the docker syntax is generally docker followed by command followed by parameters um, so for example we see here docker search image name docker pull image name docker docker run image name or something like this right so um, those were the basic primitives and then there's some options that can be provided alongside in the last session i briefly motivate the idea of port mapping you can also map environmental variables so you can inject an environmental variable in Docker container, you recall any application where that was relevant? Environmental variables, when were they relevant? There was one assignment, well, I think in the meantime, probably all the assignments you did that had cons considered this, please. Um, or like when you upload it onto an external Docker hosting platform, you can uh, get, uh, well, they assign a port to you that's yeah. random and you have to get it dynamically. Exactly. So, so one example is the Heroku port association, right? So where basically you read environment variable and associate the given port, whatever it may be, to your internal container. And they're still hosted somewhere on port 80, but you don't know how the internal wiring is, what actual port it will be hosted on, on the signal disk flexibility. The other concept that exists as well is the idea of volumes. So 
uh, in the Docker world, it probably should have been on the three slide as well, uh, in terms of uh, terminology, in addition to image and container, there's a concept of volumes. And volumes are basically just data storage. Uh, so they don't have, you know, a running, they're not a running container in a sense that there's something executed on them, but they're merely there for storage. They can also be used and shared across multiple containers. So they have a shared volume there, right, too. You can kind of back up and deal with this volume separately, which is quite neat. Um, Docker can, of course, also write to the host operating system directly to the file system, which you would probably assume, but it's, of course, you probably get the sense that may not always be clever, right? So because you want to keep the host machine clean and it dissociated from um, those particular services, but then the volume would be the cleverer and right way to do it, especially since volumes can actually be managed by Docker uh, itself as well, whereas the host operating system, of course, not. Okay. Some other things like restart um, uh, policies and so on. So that's basically um, the idea. So when we think about images, um, let me just um, bring up the concept again. Um, so then we have you know various ways of doing this. Let me just um, bring up my machine again. So this takes a bit. Like that. No, come on, come on. I'll be there in a second. I did time out too, too much. That's not a good idea, right? So what I'm doing right now is just logging back into my uh, system with more of success here. Yeah. Um, so. Just a second. For some reason the system did something I shouldn't have right now, but that's how things are sometimes. Um, but, but, um, can we do a um, early break so i'll just uh, we'll restart um, at five past four so then i'll continue then it's probably better than wasting your time right now sorry for that okay let's continue where we left off or i left off rather so let's see um so last session i briefly motivated the use of you know, docker let's see if I can... Uh, um, briefly motivated the use of Docker uh, using some examples. Can you see that somewhat? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the main point for from a navigational perspective is, of course, to um, get. Let's see if I can increase the appearance. And um, the the main point is to boom, 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 go to my primary appearance. appearance. Let's increase the font size a bit. Did it do anything good? Is to uh, understand the different components, right? So um, talk about the Docker daemon to some extent, then containers, and then um, of course the commands you can perform. So last session I mentioned that um, in order to see all the images that um, you have installed in a particular demo or downloaded in a particular demo, uh, you can access by using uh, Docker images. So if you follow the instructions in um, the Docker shorthands, you can also uh, add um, Docker. Um, um, 
add your user to the Docker, uh, Docker group and thereby not need to run sudo. So that depends on the installation. How do I didn't do it here? So uh, anyway, so there's no images on machine. And the other command was uh, sudo docker ps, and that is kind of basically borrowed from the standard Linux Unix command to see running processes. And uh, this shows running processes. If you want to see all processes, even the non-running ones, you would need to contextualize and running ps-a. So you see that this system is inherently clean and empty. Right now, it's not anything running on it. That's basically the idea. The last session, I mentioned that uh, a reasonably easy way of kind of, um, you know, like, um, well, installing anything is basically to use Docker Run. I have an example here that is a bit involved just to see if it actually does its job still. Uh, yep. So, um, you know, just to, um, you basically just say, here's an image, please run this thing with a set of parameters. So here I was interested in linking, for example, uh, volumes, um, and I was interested in uh, um, um, linking ports, as you see. So we talked a bit about um, the, the, the port linkage last time. I get back to that more today in any case. But this is basically a tool that is for network monitoring and so on. But it needs a, a set of uh, features it has, needs to have access to. And one of them is, for example, um, the uh, monitoring of uh, processes, which sit in a proc uh, directory in the operating system and um, further system information that sits on the sys. Um, directory and that's basically linked into that very um, service itself so the idea is that reasonably complex setups such as those services can be pretty much um, can be pretty much you know uh, spun up with basically one simple command let's see if I can even get access to it and if not uh, well hopefully um, just to motivate this a bit Ah, probably not because of my um, network setup, of course, right now. One thing to bear in mind, every time we spin up things, of course, we need to bear in mind that our OpenStack, uh, I use OpenStack, by the way, here right now, has the corresponding security group set up. So um, I didn't set up the 1999. It's kind of a um, choice to be outside of the main, um, the mainstream of um, services. Let's see. Let's create a new security group. Let's show you that as well. Yes, my existing security groups. Let's create a new one. I don't want to delete one anyway, but let's see. Net data, uh, create a new one. And then now TCP access at rule ingress, um, ingress port 1999. Bear in mind, you can also specify port ranges here. Something's very helpful if you have multiple ports, ports sitting um, alongside each other. So it's TCP allowing from everywhere or anywhere really so and this should be good now i need to associate this security group with the instance which happens to be that host here edit security groups there we go attach this one to it and we should be good to go so So this is the IP of my uh, virtual machine. Now we see, okay, if she picks it up, so it should be running right now and shows me some magic of my system, apparently, uh, of that VM that is, right? So so you load a bit higher right now, uh, now going down again because this tool itself is quite quite heavy. And But that's the main point. The um, the idea is to use particularly complex, uh, um, you know, software setup and, uh, you know, make this setup very simple and standardized. This tool is very, very feature rich, can, you know, link to, uh, not only your own system services and networking to other monitor other machines and so on um and usually setup could have been quite painful but you saw it's basically one command away effectively so how do you inspect those kind of things and get a bit more of a sense because i, I imagine came up with this url which is of course uh, you know uh, may look interesting but the point is where do you actually find this and this is docker hub basically and where you effectively just search for uh, you know, whatever you're interested in. In my case, was I knew it's net data, but if it's Nginx, you can find it here um, or whatever else other service, right? So, um, and generally what they provide you with, um, all those service providers, of course, what's the name of the, of the um, service you're running, of course, and then usually some sort of official documentation, how to run stuff with Docker or not, uh, things like that. Um, what is probably even more, uh, more relevant for you um, as, someone who is running an environment 
is to think about which versions, and that's the main point about Docker Hub, it does versioning, which versions of a particular deployment do you actually want to um, run? Let me minimize this current just to see what the typical instruction looks like. So the destruct, uh, instruction is basically completely up to, up to them, right? They're basically redirect to another service and give you all the different um, configurations you could possibly um, use in order to install or run NetData as an instance here. But what the interesting thing is, and that's really that here are the tags. So um, you can use tags to identify different versions of a um, particular, um, you know, Docker image, for, for example. Of course, the classical numerical versions, but also uh, the default value is latest. So if not, uh, no, no tag is assigned, the latest one is pulled. Um, but you can see and can backtrack through all previous um, versions of that um, as well. So if you click on latest right now as well, you get an insight in what, the, what this image is about uh, to some extent. And I'll get back to that in a bit. I just want to motivate this briefly. I mentioned that um, there are, uh, there's a concept of layering. So every time you compile something in, in Docker, um, you are basically, um, you know, incrementally building up your Docker image by running individual commands. That's the idea of versioning that's somewhat built in there. Um, and those commands are basically, you know, for example, trivially outlined here. It doesn't, the details don't matter right now, but let's say there's something like adding a file is happening, some command seems to be executed, then something else, or uh, yeah, th then uh, some other command seems to be running, which does something in the background. There is uh, a definition of an argument. We get back to those prefixes. There's an environment variable that's referenced, something is run again, something is copied again. So you see, it's basically doing all those manual processes that you would need to do otherwise do manually if you followed an instruction of whatever kind right especially it can get reasonably complex and kind of um just, yeah uh, confusing as well so but alongside with this you also see uh, a reference to space because you basically see um over here all you have for example the image size this image that i just downloaded uh, or not exactly that but in any case has a roughly size of 100 megabytes uh, but you're wondering yourself okay where's that all coming from but you can actually backtrack it as well it's quite neat in in docker by uh, navigating here and see okay hang on uh, this particular command, uh, you know, contributed 51 megabytes to it. This is another four. Uh, this is a few kilobytes, uh, well, you know, one megabyte roughly, another 12 megabyte, and so on. So you see how this um, um, this layer incrementally builds up the complexity that you find in in those uh, images. So and you can expect that as well. So just to briefly motivate it, but um, this is basically also the the foundation for. Um, the construction of the images because you'll find that the images are constructed by a set of primitives and again this is just for impression not for you know anything particular instructor i just want to show you what the primitives generally are and i get back to the, all of those there's always a kind of a prefix and then there's some sort of a parameter associated with this right so the environment variable arguments copying work directory set up something is run and so on um and more arguments and so on and more copying and eventually there's a, a specification of a endpoint expose means that what's the port that um, actually the service will be listening on and so on. So there's a set of predefined uh, Docker primitives that you can use to construct um, any, any, any of those um, Docker files that configure things. So, but um, first of all, I just uh, wanted to kind of, um, um, you know, um, step back a bit from this complexity and just say, okay, let's, let's try this a bit more manually and to see, uh, get a sense of what the, what's happening inside those Docker containers and so on. So, and what we can do to this end is um, just basically, um, you know, start constructing one ourselves from, from, the, from, the, from, from the baseline basically. And the, right now I'm um, just pulling, first of all, uh, Ubuntu, that's that is correct, I hope so, let's see. And so do Docker pull, of course. And this basically does, hey, I'm pulling the Ubuntu, uh, you know, um, system libraries basically in the latest version thereof. I didn't provide a tag. Tag would have been appended with colon and then tag number. The end, it just, it pulls the latest uh, uh, Ubuntu library right now. So it's doing not anything else, not running it. It's just pulling it. And um, seems like, like a 90 megabyte in total eventually, if it's like three slices, I don't know. Um, Okay, that's an interesting network performance we experience here right now. Usually it took, oh yeah, no, it's just for a few bytes. So 
So, but again, I mentioned it last time, um, the, the uh, Docker uh, demo parallelizes this activity by, um, you know, drawing on those individual layers you just kind of saw and download, downloading those um, um, separately or in parallel rather, uh, and uh, thereby optimizing performance. So, okay, cool. We have it now. There's unique identifiers, this digest um, uh, representation here, and it says, hey, there's something new now, there right now to run sudo docker images. I should see this, and I do. Well, in fact, I see two now, right? The one was the previous image that this net data environment that I just quickly downloaded and ran, but here more immediately the Ubuntu one. And what we can do with this now is actually we can enter those images, um, or particularly that one, uh, interactively. You can actually see what's, you get a bit of a glimpse inside such a container. What am I doing here? I'm running, um, I'm running uh, sudo, I always forget docker, I need to remember this thing, it's the obvious, um, sudo docker run dash ii interactive t connect the terminals as well. Interactive doesn't just necessarily mean that you can interact with this, but it just says that you look inside the yeah, um, uh, container. So basically it connects the standard streams effectively. Um, and then eventually or not, you will actually be in there. Of course, you need to start this um, environment first. So right now it's just the standard stock standard uh, you know, Ubuntu environment, the libraries there in it specifically. And you see immediately you're entering this image as root user, right? There's no conception of user management per se built in. You're just bluntly in there. Um, you have the container, container identifier associated with this as a, as a suffix, basically. And if you, if you uh, run in this image, you see a very bare bone um, kind of um, um, setup of a, of a Unix uh, environment that basically is mirrored. So it, you, you feel you're working in a complete environment, but in fact, you're not. Some uh, of the resources are mapped against the operating systems and others are completely ignored. Again, there's, for example, no um, user management in there. But you have the fundamental functionality that you have, like the ability to install, for example, now function, uh, software, because I ran, uh, I started off on the Ubuntu image, and Ubuntu brings app get as a you know installation environment. If you were not using this, you wouldn't have anything. So there's some sort of libraries that are actually brought along that we can directly use. One aspect I want to show you as well, quite interesting, is uh, uh, PS, or no more interesting, perhaps top. Um, you know top from the um, as process manager or like yeah in, in Linux in any case and usually that's at least full in the page right so you will see you will recall that you usually find a lot of references to um, scheduling uh, I think uh, queue management included uh, various services running background a lot of system D references and so on what you find here well guess what next to nothing because all that is actually running on the operating system but what happens in your container is two things you have bash somewhere because I entered, you know, using the console bash instance uh, that we used to interact. And then of course there's top running itself, right? So, so it's very, very lean as you see, not much going on. This has the, uh, you know, some of the efficiencies, um, the efficiency advantages that we uh, expect. I'm root, I don't need to use sudo in here. Um, so I just update, for example, um, the, the packages because I don't know how updated the Ubuntu libraries are. So we actually can also do that one. So basically it says, look into all the libraries that I've installed within this container and update those and bring it up to speed. And um, yeah, cool with that. Um, yeah, I'm not running upgrades yet, but let's say um, I can also install software. Uh, I'm installing two packages just to what, again, demo purposes. And I'm installing um, Apache. So a bit of a dinosaur, but nevertheless, one of the older web servers that we know about. And it picks up, oh, yeah, okay, I need now more, um, I need a bit more of um, um, uh, libraries, right, that are coming alongside with. So it's even can do this one. So basically, it adds another 117 megabyte of uh, data into the service, for instance. So let's see how quickly that goes. Network comes back slowly, I think, hopefully forgivingly so. Um, So you can do quite a bit with those uh, containers, so inspection, uh, installation of software, you can even copy files in and out of there and so on. So quite a bit of functionality is offered. Uh, um, so let's see. One thing that we can't immediately do is to um, uh, reconfigure the host side of the um, container interaction. We'll see that in a bit. So I need to move to this. I now need to say geographic area. Let's go with this doesn't really matter what we do right now. Just setting up this, this, this server, so just again, too motivated. So, and once that is done, um, yeah, we should also have that running. Um, 
well, we probably don't have it running yet, that is. Um, you need to invoke this um, externally. So, all right. If you go exit, uh, I'll leave this container again. So let's look at sudo ps. And we'll see. Well, not too much. Let's have a look again. Docker ps dash a. Ah, we see a bit more. So, um, the, so, so when I leave the container, uh, yeah, when I left the container, container shut down effectively, right? So it's still there, but it's just not running right now. So it's here. It's going to be distracted if they exited, you know, 15 seconds ago, pretty much when I went out, as this kind of whatever um, uh, access name sudo uh, distracted Milani. So, okay. So if we look at back at our images, Docker images, we still see we have one Ubuntu one and we have this NetData thing from before, but the Ubuntu one is still the old one, right? So I haven't done anything to it. So one option is that, that I now have is actually to, um, uh, it's similar to, to versioning, that's why I want to kind of motivate the idea a bit here, um, is to um, basically um, commit whatever I uh, actually did in this, um, this, this particular container, so I can make an image out of it. And how do I do this? Well, first of all, let's bring, not to confuse at least myself, um, I need to bring up the container ID because that's the one I need, the one that you see on the left there. That's the A4 uh, EE5BD and so on, all that kind of stuff. Now I can say sudo docker commit and then uh, good. That was easier, I thought. Hang on, where is it? Ah, there you go. Uh, So hope I got that right. I don't know. All right. So and now I can tag this and give it a name as well, right? So let's say I call this Ubuntu Apache because I installed Apache in there. I even give it a version. Let's say 0 0.1 because that's not properly tested and so on. So let's see if I got the number about right. A4 EE. Um, there's something wrong here. A4 EE. Yeah. EE. Or EE5. I, yeah, that thing. Uh, e five needs to be here. All right, it will, it will tell me anyway. Ah, cool, that seemed to have worked. Otherwise, it would be a bit faster. So, what does it do now? Well, whatever I've done to the container, so this it says, okay, make an image of this thing. I want, you know, bake this together and make it uh, an image for this thing so I can reuse it later to, to some extent, just showcasing this. So, um, eventually. Voila. Okay, cool. Let's create a new image. So if I run, now run docker, uh, sudo docker images, I have a new image there, right? You see sudo uh, uh, Ubuntu Apache, um, so on, so on. I didn't define how I want to deal with the runtime. I also didn't define what should be run inside this image, image for example. So um, this is where the kind of the, 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 uh, the, 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 the counterpart uh, comes to place. I just need to have a mini Docker file that defines how I run the internals in there. Now I know I have Ubuntu in there, I have Apache in there sitting in software, but I'm missing this bit. So, okay, so to this end, we're creating what is called a Docker file and the convention capitalized Docker file, um, no suffix. We define what image we're sourcing from. I'm getting into the primitives a bit later, so don't worry if you don't follow right now. So I basically have a from element that uh, basically says, okay, what images are we, image are we sourcing from? I called this Ubuntu and you gave it an identifier 0 0.1, the tag 0 0.1. Um, and I'll say, well, you know, I want to expose services on port 80, exposes the command thereof. The expose command, by the way, is optional in Docker. I get to that why in a bit. And then I say, hey, um, there are a few, few a bit of um, you know functionality that you actually need to execute and one of them is the um, apache service i want to automate this hence i put it in this um, environment so it's the entry point and then there's the command um, and the command is basically are the parameters that are appended to the entry point so the entry point is executed and the um, commands are appended in this process or round so um, See if that does its job. So 
I created basically just that file. So now to build this file and then okay. build uh, a bit of tag as well. Apache fine. What so so okay, let's briefly discuss what's happened here or what is happening here, I guess. Um so I modified this container. I committed the container into an ex you know, uh, into a new image, basically. So from the instance to the generalization, the image. And then I said, yeah, you know what? But we also need to define the runtime environment a bit more. And especially, of course, we want to expose functionality on, let's say, port 80 in this instance here. And then you run the following con command internally and uh, also uh, you know, those parameters attached to it, basically. What you see here right now is that um, it takes the original container that I had permitted. And then, um, uh, so, and then basically as a next step, um, runs that command expose 80. So it defines that there's something exposed on all 80. Um, and um, following this one, the entry point, and in all instances, it's removing the previous intermediate container. So every time it, it bakes um, something uh, into a existing container, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it combines those two, two uh, slices effectively. And once it has a subsequent container that also says, oh, yeah, now I want to bake in yet another command, it automatically deletes the preceding container as well. So there's a concept of versioning in there that retains the mid container. And then, um, well, it creates yet another image. So now we're in image number, I'm slowly using track. So I need your help here. How many images do we have right now? Uh, this is image number three, right? Ubuntu is downloaded. Ubuntu Apache is what I did. Apache final is the one that um, has been uh, created um, right now. It's now I want to run this just to complete this confusion. And then we discuss this thing. So um, uh, sudo docker run dash d detached. So I run this thing without asking me any questions. We run it on port um, uh, 80. 80 80 should be empty, I think, um, on the host and then port 80 in Apache. Remember, we exposed port uh, 80 there. I wanted to expose port 80 there and uh, name it, uh, name it mostly to have an easy reference. And then finally, we call the image that we want to run Apache final. So this should bring this eventually up and hopefully. Um, That thing, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, we can also see what's happening here. That thing is still running apparently. Good. Uh, not that it really. So and now it's not conflicting. Eighty eight. Wow, oh, what's it doing here? Yeah. So we have no bunch. You know that was what I expected. Basically, just uh, the, the the homepage basically saying, "Hey, this thing is running somehow." Okay. So this is. Um, just to motivate two things that I wanted to show. Um, one thing was that containers behave a bit like normal uh, operating systems. Like if you look inside, they're a minimal set of functionality. So they don't have a full set of functionality, but enough to run something, right? And you define the minimum functionality. You say, hey, I want an Ubuntu environment because I need to run app get. In this instance, I needed to download, for example, from the default Ubuntu repository. So back to operating system side, more or less. Um, all the functionality of you know the software binaries for, for for Apache in this particular instance, right? And then I said internally, okay, now let me configure this container so whenever it starts, it does the following. That was this other file that I basically did, right? So I confused those, uh, mixed those two things together, mostly just to motivate um, uh, the approach. So, so this is one approach, um, or it's a basically a hybrid approach that I used. But uh, the idea was basically to showcase you how you can interactively build containers by you know uh, configuring to your liking and then committing this whole thing and then you're kind of good right so i guess um so this is this is one approach to it um but it's not the not, not the only one um and it has of course well do you see advantages or different disadvantages of this approach by having this you know me on the one hand uh going inside and committing things and getting to my liking what could be a disadvantage of this approach Any disadvantage, please? Um, Was that easy? 
Yeah. I was wondering in terms of security. Yeah. How okay. is that configured when creating a Docker instance? Because if you only include the necessary libraries to run on applications, isn't security aspects really uh, I don't know how to say that configured in your application, given that you know you don't have this kind of Ah, yes. Security. Okay, yeah. Um, that's right. So, very good point you're making. Uh, yeah, security of that aspect. It's a bit similar to, uh, remember how we, yeah, I mean, uh, the answer is not complete because security can exist, you know, from the operating system side and then, of course, within the application side, right? I ignore the application side a bit, right? Now, let's say SQL injection or whatever I've used that, or shortcomings maybe in Apache in terms of budget bugs. But um, in how, uh, how far this works, the idea is also there to isolate based, uh, like similar to security groups in the OpenStack world by saying, you know, you can only access those parts. The isolation here happens via the port specification that I have. Right, so this is only on port 8080 can you do anything. Everything else is just um, not accessible unless I specified explicitly. Fundamentally, it's vulnerable if you were to get ro remotely close to a container because there's no, there's only one user in there in this particular instance, the root user, <laughs> and that you know um, is of course uh, you know has um, yeah top level privileges can do anything in that particular container. Um, yes, so if um, the idea is to resolve. Um, 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 deal with this twofold. On the one hand, um, offloading most security concerns, of course, or uh, primarily relying on the application level security concerns and fixing those ones. But it also forces you, for example, if a new version of Apache comes out, to rebuild the container. That's effectively what you would do. Um, but the re leave the rest to the configuration of the Docker daemon effectively in, 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 as to what is um, accessible. Because only the port, let's say 8082 in this particular instance and so on, will be you know, routed through to this particular container. The rest will bounce at the host level effectively. Um, yeah, so that's my response. I hope that that is somewhat uh, channeling, it, uh, channeling it. But it does not have a dedicated, let's say, universal firewall, which is a built in Ubuntu or something like this, right? Or, you know, or the, the, the armor functionality that kind of holds off traffic and so on. No, it's very much the same as the security groups in OpenStack. So very comparable in that respect. But coming back to the image. So what I showed you, I want to motivate this, is basically I pulled a beta image, I did some magic in there, yeah, and I committed this thing and said, hey, here's my magic new image, now build from this because it's the best printed image on the planet. Then I used this again and somehow did something to it. So this is one way of dealing with this, like basically building the container from within, or sorry, the image more or less from within. Um, and what, what's the problem with this? And then I built on top of it. I said, hey, yeah, use this base image, and build another base image, you know, uh, use this Docker file and run some commands on it. Well, please. Uh, I don't know, I mean, it's not really convenient, it's not really fast, of course. Yes, that's not convenient, that's uh, mildly, yeah. Well, uh, I would have put it harshly. I would say, uh, you know, I see it in a positive way, it depends what you really want to do, because if you want a Ubuntu image with specific things installed on it, then maybe it's good. Okay, yeah. So the response would be on the one hand, it's somewhat inconvenient. That's definitely the case. Uh, but on the other hand, it's very direct. So it allows me high level of customization, marking in the image directly. But it has one major downside. The idea is basically you should never build image, images this way. And the reason is quite simple. You get the golden image effect. So you do something in there, it worked somehow, you commit this thing quickly, right? And, and never touch it again, right? That, that it works, I know it, I promise. You know, please use that image and only that one. But you didn't make explicit what your changes actually are, right? Suddenly it comes baked into this you know, into this image that everything else relies on your organization, especially if it's like hierarchically, because now my, you know, the, the other image that was built on top of it was actually explicit about what you're doing in there. It says build from this image, expose port 80, run the following command persistently in the foreground, then you have my running web server. That should not be this way. So basically the idea of even the installation that I now did handy. Uh, by hand basically should be encoded as part of this docker file as well so you shouldn't have a 50 50 kind of uh, composition of, of of your of your images but actually all images especially in production environment should be built based on build files completely right so you should rely on docker files but for exploring figuring it out and getting going in the first place probably a good idea right so going interactively um, but it also shows you what you can do inside in the first place um, but in actually in, in order to build proper images you are supposed to use um, that's the idea, a uh, proper um, Docker file. So that's the motivation here. Motivation here, I just wanted to uh, suggest that there are two ways of doing things uh, in Docker, right? So doing interactively or using build files. From now on, I only look at build files 
um, just to be clear that this is the proper way to do it. So what I didn't talk about really extensively other than briefly showing it, it was, you know, how do those files look like? I said Docker file needs to be capitalized, that's probably it. Um, they have a kind of a fixed um, syntax to some extent, um, or in a variable syntax, but uh, with a fixed layout. And they always um, characterize a, a um, they, have, they have some sort of Docker primitive on the on the far left as a command, and then a parameter associated with this. You can also run, of course, operating specific, system specific commands. But the idea is that you can compile an image or configure a file using very simple primitives. Right? You have a basis of which you work. You add files from the host system or from elsewhere from the environment. You run things. Right? So to configure something, bring something up. You install software possibly, um, and then you expose ports. I guess. And um, yeah, you need to indicate what's the entry point, meaning what was actually starting the operating system, right? So, um, and that's that's basically the idea. So a Docker file now, quite primitively, has only a you know set of functionality. There, there is quite a bit more. I I, I can show I'll show the reference page, of course, for, um, that's provided by um, um, Docker and should be consulted in all instances. But just to get you a baseline understanding of how those files look like, they always start with a from. From indicates what's the base image, right? In, in, in worst case, the base image is called from scratch. That's an empty image. So it's quite a neat uh, pun there. But point is, each Docker file starts with a from, and that signals what the base image is where you start from. Um, so in my instance, I just said Ubuntu, for example, right? So, uh, but in the absence of a specific uh, uh, reference to, you know, say, Ubuntu version that's 20 or 4 LTS or whatever else, it just pulls the latest. So that's, yeah, uh, one way of doing that. That's not best practice because you get, of course, a bit of a non-deterministic behavior over time because you don't know what the latest version will be if you run it two years down the road, right? Let alone you spin up yet another five instances uh, one minute after the, you know, uh, what would be the next be um, the 21.4 version of Ubuntu is possibly released soon or sooner or later. So it's not a good idea. So you want to be, especially in production, you want to be specific about this tag. Uh, in any case. So then there's generally by um, um, convention uh, a reference to the maintainer. So who's responsible for this thing, right? So it's like as usual in life, um, it's kind of a label there. Um, then you can specify environment variables with env, environment um, as a primitive, quite straightforward, uh, which may be relevant, like such support variable that you're interested in. They can, of course, also be injected from the outside, but they can also be mapped or defined from the inside, right? So if that's relevant. Um, then you can. Um, you know, do a lot of or pretty much any sort of system level operating system level operation, if you like, using cool run commands, run the following thing. This becomes, of course, very specific to the image, the operating system image that you're referencing. For example, here we um, using Ubuntu. Guess what? I can only use uh, Ubuntu libraries, right? So if I'm um, having an Alpine Linux, for example, which is oftentimes the basis for Docker containers because very slim. Um, they don't support apt-get, right? So I can't use um, apt-get, but I need to use the native um, um, package manager for this purpose and so on. So this is specific, again, the commands here to that library that you, you know, support based on your from a directive in the beginning. Then you can also um, add files from externally. So the idea is you have a Git repo, and you have some files in there you want to inject. You can add those uh, using the add command in the build process. Basically, drag in this file, drag in this file, drag in this file. Yeah? And change the set up the work directory saying if you want to have a complex directory structure in your container you can set this up or you can run everything at root if you don't do anything else just run it at root you would never do those things in a proper operating system but in your container that's uh, uh, less problematic because it's dedicated to this particular service right if there's a complex com of course a complex structure you have all the flexibility to create directories as well using the run command right run mkd right or run rm if you want to delete stuff so run is kind of a kind of um, a wild card, if you like. Um, if you want to link an external volume that exists in your container, you can reference this as well. But generally, um, you would reference this, you know, from from the command when you run Docker run using dash v. Uh, you can define ports by saying expose port eighty or eighty eighty. Um, and as a final step, you define the entry points. Like think the main method effectively. You can have multiple of those. Uh, because you can call them when you instantiate um, the um, um, when you instantiate the, the Docker container, but it, by default um, in, there's a CMD command that basically makes reference to the last entry point, and the CMD command itself uh, holds parameters that you pass to it. So you saw me just uh, just earlier defining uh, the Docker 
uh, file for the Apache. Basically, I said here, the entry point is Apache to CTL. It's a control tool that runs Apache and command only held the parameters that you pass to it during the uh, instantiation. So, okay. We have multiple of those. The last one will run. Okay. Generally, you don't have, it should be quite linear. In fact, the execution in, in all instances, in our case, talking Golang here, it will be quite linear anyway. Uh, one comment, expose is purely documentary. So there's no requirement for you to specify the ports you're actually exposing, uh, like hard requirement, but it's good convention because it signals the expectations that let's, for example, all oh, this thing will serve on port 80 or 8080 or whatever else, right? So it's particularly good if there's no further documentation, you can at least infer which ports likely should be mapped because Docker doesn't quite, well, Docker doesn't know what those entry points will eventually be listening to, right? So it doesn't know it's listening on port 80 or 8080 because it doesn't look into the binaries. But this is, has some documentary uh, value there. It needs to go, ah, cool, I need to do the port mapping then from host to port 80 in order to, to ensure that I get something going here. Um, the reason for this flexibility is that uh, you may be, um, uh, the, the, you may be, you may be um, um, modifying or the, the underlying binary, and then there would be a conflict between the expose and the um, uh, port that is actually exposed by the underlying, you know, the software that you're running. So Docker can't really inspect this, um, you know, properly and ensure it. So this only has documentary purpose. But I would encourage you to always specify it. I think it's, I find it super helpful because it tells me a lot about. Um, how things look from the um, the inside. Okay, um, well, you know how how does how do containers see the world actually, right? So based on on the stock file specification, they have have access to a network stack. You can use you know TCP, bind TCP ports, UDP ports, and so on. You have process IDs. You saw uh, briefly top running. However, a few of those the mount points as well. So it's where the volumes can be mounted. It has time sharing principles, uh, um, inter-process communication, so it can communicate between processes as well. And we have also user and group IDs. So you can actually create users in there, even though, why would you? I mean, like in many instances, you just want to run stuff and then never exit again. Docker container are primarily meant to run headless, of course. This interactive mode is just more for debugging or looking into things. And they're actually quite nice tools for debugging in the first place as well. So. Just to clarify a few, this is a syntactic clarification because it's a question or concern that often comes up. What's the difference between run, entry point, and command? Um, as we run is running internal commands, stuff that's you know run during the build process, not the execution process of the container. Whereas entry point uh, CMD reference like something that's relevant at runtime. So when you instantiate a container, what's actually executed um, um, there? And the entry point basically defines one or more entry points, the fixed executable. Um, that's that's um, contained, but CMD um, you know allows you to customize uh, the different parameters. So you can have different variants of this program, different parameters that are run um, when you instantiate the container. So yeah, so that's the that's the main point there. CMD generally provides the parameters only. That's the um, idea there. Okay, right. Okay, a lot of talking. Um, so the um, there are some some best practices that um, probably don't really make sense yet. So probably we rather do something uh, meaningfully first. But um, all right. So what I wanted to show you a few tools. So okay, now you're wondering. Okay, we have this tool. We have this running here, and it kind of even works magically. This Apache demo thing, for whatever reason, is now not the optimal thing. Uh, is there also an option to you know inspect what it's actually doing at runtime? Since I'm not allowed to go into the uh, container interactive or shouldn't go into the container interactively and just can, can just tell you the tool you want to know about is sudo docker logs um and then you use the instance tag name meaning the container tag name and it basically just shows you a uh, log output from that particular container at runtime right so if you can also follow it um i think it's dash f for follow as unix convention and it basically binds to the output of that particular container so you can see anything that comes out of it. Super helpful when you run your Golang services, right? You're wondering, oh, it's still not working. It works on my machine. I didn't get anything. Put it in a container, suddenly breaks everything, right? You want to know what's going on. Sudo docker logs and then the, the instance, right? So that's, that's the way to go and there as well. Another tool, so you can break out of this control C. Another cool tool that I uh, just want to highlight is um, kind of stats. 
um, because that's kind of neat way of um, like one of the objectives of any hypervisor to some extent in the Docker daemon is uh, as well to monitor resource usage, right? We want to keep track of what's actually happening there. Sometimes we want to know, okay, is there, you know, how much load does my service put on the processor or whatever else? Docker stats does it for you. Basically tells you how much memory you use. What's the limit? Well, four gig, okay. Well, it uses five megabyte right now, memory. Uh, so 0.05%, uh, 0.15%, sorry. Uh, what's the network, you know, load and all those kind of things. So it's it's quite neat to have this um, handy as well. Okay, so one tiny, right. um, Docker images. Let's see if we get something there. I just want to show you. We can also, to some extent, um, extract. So uh, earlier I made the point that uh, you get this old golden film image effect because you don't quite know what's happening inside the image. You can actually, to some extent, or yeah, to a considerable extent, retrace what's actually happening behind the hood or under the hood uh, by using history. So if you have a um, image and you want to know what has been happening in there, um, those are basically that's the um, that, that's the commands that have been executed in there, right? So evidently in the original image, that must have been the Ubuntu image that I downloaded because it's two days ago, um, the following commands have been executed. You know, um, um, a file has been added, uh, some, um, that seems to be like a bash file has been added. So various uh, activities have been done, uh, a directory has been created for uh, setting up system B likely, and bash uh, has been executed and run two days ago. And we arrived, you see how this built up quite neatly, for uh, 72 to 141 megabytes, right? So that's where actually, you know, by, by running this effectively, um, this um, image uh, grew in size. And then I added a bit more to it. I said, you know, um, we, we um, exposing port 80 and have those entry points on top of this. So basically that's some of the, um, you know, steps you can retrace, but it's partial and it's, uh, you know, challenging is a bit, bit more magic than meaningful. So um, having clean Docker files is, clearly preferable. Okay, so now let's turn it around and in the remaining few minutes, let's um, see if we can use apply this to Docker a bit more because um, I get the sense that it can feel a bit, um, you know, um, of course, challenging to think about all those this complexity, but how do we do it from scratch? That's, um, that's the main motivation. Um, so let me just motivate this briefly by pointing to admittedly a simple service and that's by intent. So um, I mentioned this service before I used it to signal or to um, showcase the um, load balancing that you could do in Google Cloud Compute. And that's the same service with mild extensions. I'll just iterate over this service again briefly. So the idea is basically that you have a few entry points. One is called count, reset, kill and exit. We get to that. Um, and the idea is basically that this is a service that basically just counts up. So you can just see that the service runs and counts, uh, you know, some sort of uh, int, uh, basically, and uh, ah, yeah, reminds you to, to do what you want to do. And you can reset it. I added it with two additional handlers, so the count can be reset. Two additional handlers, one is called um, exit failure, the other one is exit properly or proper. So uh, what it means is basically it exits with different exit codes. Um, you, you guys know that exit code zero means everything is fine, proper exit, right? So proper termination of program. Anything else is uh, usually considered, you know, error of whatever nature, and that's program specific. There's no convention as to what one, two, three, or five means. As long as not zero means something went sideways. Bad luck. Look at the documentation. You'll figure it out. So I emulate this here. I'm, I'm basically just, you know, saying, okay, exit this bluntly. So because I want to have a bit of magic going here. So, but that's the fundamental service. Quite straightforward. No, no big deal. There's a go mod file in there as well, uh, but you know, nothing you haven't seen before. So, quite. Quite a straightforward service, and um, let's see, see if we can just uh, get this going. But it has pretty much all the ingredients that you need to think about when you uh, instantiating your own version of it. Okay, that's the very service. So uh, now we have a, hopefully we have something here. Uh, yeah, CD simple service, okay. So this is the, the repo, the one you have basically uh, seen up there um, before just now. And the idea is now, okay, the only thing we need to do is to add a Docker file. That's this, this file again that I mentioned just before. 
convention capital, but then it's picked up pretty much by uh, a wide range of infrastructure there. So we say now, okay, I want to build in Golang, right? So we, we now need to have a build environment that helps me actually, you know, uh, build, uh, compile those files because I didn't provide the binaries for the sources. And I say even, you know, I want version 1.16. So if you go to Docker Hub and you say type Golang, you find all the versions of uh, uh, the Golang um, in, environment basically available there. And that's how easy you, uh, it is to obtain them, right? So again, the whole latest convention counts as well. So if you don't specify, we'll pull the latest, which maybe, please. No, it, uh, the, the, the Go mod file, no, it doesn't need to be uh, the same. It's just a matter of the question whether the, you know, the features are there to support it. So I, I in fact, <laughs> This, this server is so simple, it probably runs on, no, it has modules, so go 113, I think it's minimum, but it, uh, it doesn't need features from 115, so that it's a bit of a stretch, but I'm just saying I'm running 116, but I could also say uh, run anything else, it wouldn't really matter. So, keeping my own word, I say, you know, um, I'm just putting the maintainer uh, label there. So again, convention. Now I say, what's the work directory in this um, in this image? So work directory, I just say slash. I don't care about anything else, right? So because again, the only thing I want is run my service right now and then, uh, you know, be peaceful about it. But you could come up with more complex structures. So remember, in, I'm in my repo right now. And the repo has those files, main.go and go.mod. Go.mod is needed, otherwise it doesn't recognize the module. And then we complain, oh, please put this all into the go path, and I don't want to muck around with the go path, which is always in uh, go source uh, the other way around. Yeah, I think so. There you go. It's already messy. So go path not um, the friendliest of um, things, so we want modules. Well, how do I do it? Well, basically said now, um, copy from host to client. So I say in the same um, directory, the directory the Docker file sits in, because that's the so-called build context. Um, you can also reference uh, Docker files from elsewhere, but generally the, the environment in which you, uh, you know, initiate the Docker build process is the build context and um, the um, Docker file can only draw on files that sit within that hierarchy below it. So it can't move outside and draw files from elsewhere. Of course, via network possibly, but at least not in the build process. So that's when it comes to file organization, that's where you find commonly that Docker file sits on top of your repository, but not necessarily, sometimes um, there are exceptions to it as well so all right so i just got uh, get the modules file in and the other one that i want is the main.go those are two files i'm going to get in so now my process is basically i need to compile those and i use the run command for this right so it's a generic do something within but it doesn't uh, affect me at runtime uh, and then just use the standard um, flags for um for compiling for a Linux environment. Uh, a few weeks back, we talked about the ability to build for pretty much any system on any system. Uh, and that's uh, the case here. So I'm saying I'm building for a Linux environment and running go build with a set of flags. And those flags basically said, hey, um, afford a static linking of the dependencies. Sorry for this odd typing, it's really my yeah, distancing here. Um, um, and um, in, yeah, in this um, perform a static linking of the relevant uh, libraries. Uh, hang on, where do we have it? And that's uh, based from pretty much taken from the Go documentation, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, it's passed to that compiler and the output is main. I will expect an output main. So that's the executable I want to do. And um, afterwards, um, yeah, run main, I guess. Let's try that. Because that should be the compiled file afterwards. So that's a relatively slim um, Docker file, right? So it doesn't hurt that much. Not like the other stuff you may have seen um, before. So. Let's see, let's save this thing. And uh, again, it sits in the main main directory, so there's no um, you know additional navigation uh, needed. The simple service does it? Yeah. Is there any metric that I need? No. Okay. So uh, now I want to build this sudo docker uh, build. Um, specify the build context. I want to build it here, and I want to tag it, and I call this simple. Uh, Mm -hmm. 
service. Good. Oops. No, yeah, it will be all lowercase. Oops. Okay. Right. Okay. So now he took a Docker file and basically executing all those steps. First of all, it downloads Golang as expected. This is cached, of course. So if you have multiple, uh, you run at the same time again, you know, this image will be kept in any case. Um, extracts, pull down or complete. So it's the first step. And the second step will be then the next command. It runs the label command, even though it doesn't do much other than just uh, signaling who is the maintainer. And then setting up the work directory, indicating what that is. So it does all those different steps. It's sluggish for, for Monday afternoon, to be honest. I usually expect uh, no one be, I think there's something going on in the system down there, but we get there. So uh, at the files, right, this literally takes, interacts with the host system, says, hey, bring those files in right now, and then do perform the compilation. It may take a bit. Um, so no C extensions, compile for Linux, and uh, compile static linkage. And then you have the main binary executable, hopefully, and then it just says run this thing. So that will be the next command once the compilation is done, which appears to take a while. Oh, yeah, we're getting there. So this is not running the image, it's building the image only, right? Compile, and then we need to later run it with Docker run. Um, yeah. So the first reference to our um, 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 yeah, invocation to Docker run, so it also takes it as um, simple service latest, right? So it's now the latest tech I want to run this. Okay, the first um, reference needs to, of course, include all the different parameters. So we want to say uh, Docker run, we want to make this thing um, um, detached. That's right. Um, and we have port linkages. I'll just take port. Um, hang on, which one did I bind already? Let's say 8081 from the host to 8080 on the client. 8081 to 8080 on the on the container, of course. Um, and I call this simple container so let's see if that, uh, it's simple so that's the reference sorry that's um the reference to the existing image that i want to build from so sudo docker run da, 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 da. okay uh i uh, give it a name as well first service I was quick. Okay, so sudo docker ps. Right. Okay, does it run or did I break it already? No, it's still running. Good. So, um, good indicator to see whether things worked out is to check the status um, column, right? Oftentimes, you have a, you start an image and actually it will look like it's running, but it actually breaks immediately. Likely something's going on. Docker logs is your friend. Have a look what's happened inside, right? So, here right now, it's, it looks quite okay. So, we have this Im image running for simple service. The command it executes also good for debugging to figure out which command it actually put, picked up on. Uh, and it started around then five seconds ago. There's a linkage between port 8081 to port 8080. So if I count now on my host port 8081, I probably get the service output. Let's hope. Uh, yeah, hang on. Just take this one instead. Yeah, that's right, there's a patch around that one. 8081. Right, okay, cool. So that's that weird service. Cool. So, and I can do, you know, my, my arbitrary calls and all that magic that I should be up with. So it doesn't have any particular functionality, but fundamentally that's what it, what it offers, and it runs now Dockerized in the Dockerized version. So let's have one glimpse at uh, Docker logs um, just to be. Uh, get a sense of what's um, happening behind the scenes. Uh, how does that first 
space. Right? And it spits out what it says on the command line anyway, nothing you wouldn't expect, like launching service on port 88, the standard kind of, uh, you know, more or less default output that you would uh, see and have there. So it seems to have kind of worked, this thing seems to run. So um, so there are a few few points I want to um, suggest, of course. Right now, I'll uh, just um, let the service run as it was, right? So I could now spin up a second version quite easily. Let's see, where is it? Um, let's say it's called a second service. Second service. And you recall that we had um, the reference of an environment variable that we can use. So I can now exactly do this and say, hey, you know what? Run this thing on port 8000 instead of 8080. Let's see if that goes. And then, of course, I need to correspondingly link now my external port. Now I take 8082. Uh, I kind of gave myself um, uh, five free ports there, basically port range in my uh, security groups. So internally, pass along port 8000 and then um, find um, port 8082 to port 8000 internally and use the same image again, simple service. Recall that was the image that I built from, but give it a different container name. So let's see how that goes. It's okay for now. That is a lot slower than before. Ah, did I forget D? No, I did have dash D. That's weird. Ah, that actually does. Well, I don't know why, but the performance is really variable. Um, talking about cloud environments, so sometimes you know you, you can't recontrol it. So okay, so we have a second service running here. Now we see the pointing how 8082 is pointing to 8000, 8081 to 8080, right? But I pass the environment variable, right, as part of the command. So hopefully picks up on this in order to. Um, just that. So if I have 8082 right now, it should also see a uh, respond. That's the first call to that service. So now they're running in parallel. So it's relatively straightforward, easy to spin up yet another instance of um, that service. Okay. Hmm. How do I do my rest here? <laughs> um, perhaps if you have a few um, more minutes, one final feature I wanted to show you is um, the idea of how do you react on error. So recall, I had those two um, features in there. So I have a count endpoint that counts incrementally, but also I had an endpoint that was called um, exit, for example, and basically it does that. It basically breaks, right? It has, an, uh, it has a zero call. If I go now to Docker PS, you'll see that one service is missing already. But if I run now sudo docker ps-a, you should see all the services still running. So um, yeah, exited. So, and it happens to be that this service here, uh, the second one, in fact, uh, I, ran, I, I um, used the exit endpoint, remember, that returns an exit code zero, is now exited with exit code zero here, right? So, and the other one's still running, that's all good. Um, the, 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 the cool part about Docker, I really like this a lot when, when hosting and um, thinking about service, especially in development phase, is you can also have it define what to do if things go south. So, um, you know, you, you don't necessarily always need to have complete access to the, to the Docker, um, Docker daemon effect, uh, but you can say in advance already, you know, I just want to anticipate that if something goes sideways, I can uh, navigate this um, as well. So spinning up a third service, of course. How many more should I do? I leave port 8000, that's fine internally. Again, there's no conflict within the container, but as long as the outside, the host side is uh, consistent, name it third service, port 8000. Um, and um, I can say something like restart on yeah, or I can say restart always it's probably nicer right now in this instance. And if I get everything right, this thing should spin up, see if it's a bit faster. Let's not bring it down immediately, let's run something more meaning uh, 983 I said, I'm hosting this one on, see if it's there already. Patience, now it should be there. Okay, let's try again. So that's that one, right? So I can do repeated calls to this one here. And 
in our run in our call exit for example it does not do anything and if i go run count again however it does nope. oops it does not come up Ah, it does come up, it takes a while. Yeah, it seems like the environment's a bit flaky. But fundamentally, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. It actually um, ensures that uh, if whenever, you know, that service breaks for whatever reason, it would bring it back up. There are various of those uh, policies, restart policy, you can say only on failure, restart it always, unless stopped. Like, you know, if it's intentionally stopped by a user, don't restart it, but in all instances. So it's quite, can be quite aggressive in terms of the daemon fighting you in development, be aware of this. But it's incredibly handy when you think about development and you have problems keeping your services going. So uh, I, I, I provide this as part of a, the, the reference as well. So in the Docker reference, which is listed on the Docker shorthands, but I think also on the, the lecture, in any case, I'll list it there. There is uh, also a reference to the restart policies that they have. And no restart default on failure, how many times you try always or unless stop. Those are the primitives that are available there. So you have this flexibility uh, effectively to um, you know, manage runtime to some extent uh, beyond what's done inside the container, basically. Cool. All right. Um, I think I'll leave it at this. Otherwise, um, I'm subject to scrutiny um, because I kept you overly long. And that's violating Norwegian labor law. I think, probably. Anyway, um, and um, yeah, okay. Leave it at this for now. Did you? Does it make basically basically sense what happens there? Quite straightforward, right? The the, the problem is not writing your stuff in the files, and so the problem is more understanding the concepts. Like you know, what is the container? What is the image again? When do I play around with the container? When do I play around with the image? How to generate a con uh, image from the container? And conversely, how do I create an instance of a container or a container from an image? Right, using Docker Run and those ones. Are there any any questions that you might have for now? Please. Uh, what happens with the port of an exit and uh, program? Does it shows up in the other list? Does it mean that the port is available? Or? No, it's bound still. They, they, I think it will. Um, let's do it. Uh, it will actually uh, tell me, hey, hang on. There's something something going on. Someone else has this port. That was 8082, right? So um, yeah. the, 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 the fourth, uh, fourth service. It registers this port 8082. Oops, it actually brought it up. Let's see. Let's see what's happening here. So we have, where's my other service? Exited. Did I pick the right endpoint? Oh, it disassociated probably. Cool. OK, the answer is there. So uh, in, in, um, um, in, in, in case the service exited, it appears to reassign the, uh, the port. I was under the impression that it would kept it. I think it may have done so in the past. That's, yeah, so now it's assigned to the fourth service. Yeah, so you see, you can run containers, you can run multiple of those with different parameters, same parameters apart from the port, which is unique, of course, uh, on the host. Um, yeah, you can have servers of different kinds, you build them in different ways. I will talk about more of efficiency of building next time, uh, briefly. Um, especially in the context of Golang, but you should, with this, actually already be in a position to possibly to spin up your own service, assignment two or whatever else, in, 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 in Docker. Just try it out. Just Dockerize that thing and see how it goes. You have all the commands, uh, basic Docker file layout. I'll push that Docker file just for reference, even though it's like super trivial, um, but that should give you enough to kind of at least try it out and see where you get stuck. Likely, I can tell you already where you get stuck, is reconstructing the pro uh, directory structure inside the so you get point is you probably get the files wrong inside the container and call the wrong command or whatever else, right? Because you need to rebuild the directory structure. It can be a bit painful, but that's likely it. So Docker logs is a good help there. Ah, I have questions about presentation. That's right. So Heroku port, yes, question. Are the presentations on Monday in person? Uh, well, I can't force anyone to come. So also it doesn't make sense because if suddenly everyone comes, I'm in trouble, not cool. 
No, they can be online, of course. Uh, we need to navigate how it's done. In, in, I mean, most of our courses are running online right now. By convention would be that you, one of, um, it, there, I can see two variants. One of each group is presenting it. The other variant is to, um, um, the, the, the other variant is, um, you know, that you have a shared screen and you kind of coordinate this remotely, how you want to do it. And if you're here in person, of course, ta -da, then you can do it live, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, presentations be graded. Well, they're, they're, they are feed into your, in your participation mark. That's where I see them situated, right? So they are, uh, uh, are reflected there to some extent, but also they give us already an impression, pretty much like a teaser, on to what we have to expect from your project more generally in terms of uh, particularly the innovativeness and the, uh, you know selling points that you want to offer in addition to code because like you know sometimes having having people talk about their product gives a different impression at least about what they intended to do than the code which reflects what they actually did do which may mean they did something different or that means they didn't get as far as they wanted to which is fine i mean that's the idea about visions you you kind of can't really often make it to the end um that's that's okay Presentations can be in English or Norwegian. I try my best doing Norwegian, but please allow me to ask questions uh, in case I didn't understand it. I need a translator probably, but uh, for, for if you stick to more common terminology, um, I probably, um, I, I can probably follow. So, Norska uh, Fint, for the skal lære lidt mere norsk, men jeg er ikke confident enough. Uh, huh? Self secret nook for for presenter faculty in holes. Thank you. Yeah, no. mere student. So uh, I mean, I can pain you through one in one semester. I offer you one forty five minute session in Norwegian by myself. I promise you. First of all, you never come back to my sessions, or you bring your chips because you'll be laughing all the time. So uh, you make the pick, but I'm, I'm promise you that will not be a content centric session. So, but uh, no, I understand it now, but. Produktion a little bit more vanskelig, a bit more vanskelig. Okay. So, uh, Norska Fint, yeah. Annette Spörschmau. One of my major learning points was that um, Spörschmau is both, both plural and singular. I didn't know that. So, anyway. No? Ah! <laughs> I thought it did figure it out. You can use it in Prova, I think. OK, OK. Anyway, see, there you go. Um, but you, you get the message. So will they be graded? Uh, they're not distinctively graded. They feed into your participation mark, right? So we'll uh, influence there. But also, um, to some extent, yes, implicitly uh, in, the, in the project mark because of the um, you know, originality and the um, kind of um, um, yeah, novelty that you want to uh, convey with part of your, you know, basically you use P, you, you, unique selling proposition is part of the grade in there. So what's the, you know, um, novelty of your project? So yes, but minuscule. Um, I'll send an issue out anyway to give more instructions on this in case people have still questions. They can also follow up by commenting and questions there. Um, so how I see the structure, but I don't see it like that super, uh, you know, like linear that everyone does the same way. I want to give you a bit of space to be, you know, to, to pitch it as you well like, but I'll tell you the main points I want to learn about. That's the main thing. Cool. Probably stop recording the stage. <laughs>